And can we please have some quiet in the audience? It's going to be very difficult for people here on stage, and also it's going to be hard to capture on video if people are talking. I guess I'll take a stab at this first. Um, a smart contract to me, this is kind of forward future thinking stuff, but to me it's it's applications and digital services operating as their own entities. So, uh, you know, I think the future is one where uh, digital properties are just as meaningful as traditional uh, corporations and whatnot, and interacting with these digital properties will have uh, you know, legal and contractual implications, and smart contracts is the means we have today to, to achieve this. So in that sense, it, you're not tying it necessarily to uh, decentralized architecture. In other words, you think a smart contract could be run on um, either a decentralized or a traditional database or just something that executes on its own for a time. Yeah, I think that you need the decentralized aspect in order to provide that layer of assurance and trust uh, to the engagers of the contract and also to give it uh, you know, some kind of weight in our traditional court systems. You, know, you need a common reference point of data and if that data is centralized, then it's much more complicated to integrate things like smart contracts. All right, that makes sense. Uh, I also have to sort of apologize to panelists because I think we only have one microphone for the panelists. Um, so we're gonna have to pass it around. There might have been a second one up there. Did anybody see a second mic on the... No, I don't see for All right, fair enough. Um, we also, I have to apologize for skipping the introduction. So maybe the mic is on, or where's the mic now? So let's go over there, and if you can just say a brief word about uh, who you are and the role you are currently playing and your connection to the smart contract. Great, so thank you, Zach. Thanks for George and everyone for having us here. My name is Zach Zillian. Actually, more now, who's counting? I lead a small team of attorneys here in Chicago. We started out five years ago focusing on the trading and investing management space. And that led naturally with the recent explosion of cryptocurrencies and so on into representing companies that are trading cryptocurrencies and ICO tokens, as well as entities that are raising money through ICOs. A little less work with, let's say, traditional companies looking to have blockchain to their architecture, but we are exposed to a lot of cryptocurrency and blockchain work. Some smart contracts, more of our companies are saying we really want to do X with smart contracts as soon as we raise some money. I'd like to see more of them actually get to that next level because it is simple to allow their, their value propositions and so the definition you just you just gave there. I haven't heard that sort of auditory approach to it, but it's a great way to work with smart contracts. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I'm Yu Shijin, I'm also known as Steve. Uh, I'm from China and I'm now regional head of Nan China. So uh, earlier, my colleague Alex has uh, did a keynote about uh, what NAM is and how NAM's smart contract is empowering all the business all over the world. So, my connection to the smart contract is that NAM also has its own understanding of how should the smart contract and plugins be built on the blockchain. So, it's not always uh, the easier way. We have choices and we can make the right choice. As well. Thank you. First of all, uh, thanks organizers uh, that they invite me to this great event. Uh, my name is Nick. I am from Ukraine, with uh, Ukraine company Alex. And we, I arrived here as a part of a group which built our head of uh, business uh, and uh, blockchain analyst. They uh, are arrived with me and free, feel, uh, feel free to communicate with, uh, with our group. So, I am architect uh, and lead the real projects in, in the Ukraine uh, for foreign customers, uh, such as uh, uh, Standard and Spur Pure Agency, a uh, big uh, Indian media group, and we have, uh, we have the real project using a hyperledger, and also we have um, the sales in Germany and for Japan. So smart can you know, we use smart contracts for business to build uh, private networks and uh, add value to their business. Hi, I'm Will Turner. I'm a partner at Barnes and Thornburg, uh, which is a MR100 law firm. I have a securities law background, and I represent a number of uh, uh, issuers, uh, investors. Uh, so, uh, my experience with uh, smart contracts is uh, in my clients' uh, experiences, uh, sometimes on the positive side and sometimes on the negative side in uh, contracts that are not uh, 
thank you, Zach, and thank you, George, for having me. I'm Daniel Riddell. I'm an advisor to the Descent Foundation. Uh, Descent is a blockchain protocol, delegated proof of stake blockchain protocol. Uh, we launched our main net in uh, July of last year, and our blockchain is specifically focused at digital content distribution. So, utilizing our blockchain, you can transact securely any type of digital content that could exist on your computer. So, it has implications across many different industry verticals, and I'm very excited about the future of smart contracts. Um, with Decent, our smart contract platform is hard coded. Uh, for reasons of efficiency and scale. If there are partners who are interested in using Decent blockchain for their own specific use cases, we do have the ability to alter the code at the, at the source code level and adapt custom smart contracts for our needs. Thank you all for those introductions. And uh, I am sort of thinking, we're, we're talking about the future of smart contracts, 2030. And before we look uh, some 10 plus years into the future, though, let's talk a little bit about the present. And um, what I would like you to think about and talk about is what do you see today in the smart contract world that is particularly exciting to you? What is, that, is there an example of a big project that you're really working on or that you have seen uh, clients or just about anyone implement that you're saying, okay, this is the direction that smart contracts are going. I'm excited to be part of this. And I do have to once again apologize for the shift on my side. Sure, uh, I guess I'll, I'll speak first then. Um, I'm very excited about smart contracts, specifically within the media and entertainment space. Um, today, as you saw earlier uh, in the presentations, there are big players like Netflix, like YouTube, who are really controlling the content distribution space at this point. Uh, I also work as CTO for a children's entertainment service, so I'm very familiar with content licensing and distribution and all of these different types of things. Uh, really. When we're talking about entertainment and content, I still believe that content is king. However, we've gotten away from that in today's distribution. Uh, companies like Netflix really do hold uh, the trump card when it comes to negotiating with their producers. And this is because there's a complete lack of transparency on how their content is engaged on these types of platforms. So by utilizing smart contracts and protocols like the Descent Protocol, we can create an ecosystem whereby content creators and publishers have the ability to transparently publish their content directly to consumers via DApps, have meaningful metrics and analytics on how their content is engaged, settle these transactions in real time, and make better informed decisions on how they're going to create the best content for their audiences in the future. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards the media and entertainment side of things, but there are many, many different uh, use cases. Uh, so I would say my experience uh, to date uh, is involving uh, transactions which change values, tokens, 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 My expectation is that uh, um, in the near future, I have the positive values for the use of uh, smart contracts to uh, create efficiencies around what I call smaller transactions that are uh, transactions that can be uh, transacted efficiently in um, and um, the of the transactors or the uh, trust issues that uh, either uh, create problems with transacting on the front end or create incentives uh, to uh, as turn out of the transactions uh, in the We talk about present uh, time. Um, uh, we, uh, and my experience with uh, smart contracts is that we already is uh, ready to use uh, such smart, uh, small smart contracts as storage data in the blockchain, uh, restrict access to that data, uh, sell and buy uh, data in the blockchain uh, smart contracts. And also we using our projects to uh, store big large data in the IPFS system and integrate blockchain with the other systems. I think um, for present nowadays most of the use case in smart contracts are using for ICOs and ready forms. But uh, for them uh, we have really a wide 
with partnership with all these kind of companies. But most of the way, uh, besides finance use, use case, we focus on uh, things like anti-safety and the supply chains. These are all using LAN technology to do certification on that, and we use LAN smart contract to power them. So this use case, I think, we are outside the traditional finance use case and it's really being great use case for the smart contract. So, let's see, in the very near future, I'm excited about using smart contracts in relation to real estate contracts, real estate transactions, because they check a lot of boxes for me. I'm thinking of these are multiple parties involved in the transaction who typically only involve each other at one time. There's no time to develop a trust relationship. Uh, and it's a pretty standardized contract. Right now, a lot of money is going to be so it's a great opportunity to reduce transaction costs, reduce, reduce just the intermediation that was required by them. I say more future, however, because I think some more work needs to be done to make the blockchain record of how the official titles of the company have that last mile problem solved. The transaction, the transaction in the digital space gets reflected in real. So for right now, before that comes into in place, I'm particularly excited about the use of smart contracts in transactions that involve solely the digital space. So for example, companies that, well, let's say swaps involving digital currency with payments and future find dates, amounts to turn based on certain digital market data and so on, or companies that want to guarantee they will pay some percentage of companies profits and transactions and the dividend or amount of which you take measures. It is not all that big set on small contract and it's a lot of opportunity there. Sure, all these not sellers and interesting applications out there today. Uh, for those panelists who have worked directly with smart contracts, um, what do you see as sort of barriers to smart contract adoption right now? Are they just hard to build? Is it hard to get acceptance? Is it hard to find a real use of real world applications for this concept? In, in a sense, I feel like the smart contract idea has been bounced around for some time now, and yet I personally am not encountering it on a regular basis, and so I'm kind of wondering what, what's standing in the way of that? Is it just a small subset of users right now, or where are we going to, where are we going to, feel free to ask them. Yes, I think you're saying both there's now, so I'm going to ask you to take this. I think the biggest obstacle at this point is the interpretation of legal parameters and code. So, basically, when you're developing a smart contract, if it's sensitive matter, um, you know, you should have the lawyers in the room, and lawyers and engineers generally don't speak the same language. So, uh, we had an instance uh, where I met a fellow in, in Hong Kong, and he actually litigated the first smart contract in the Commonwealth Court. And basically, there were two parties, and these two parties had uh, what they thought was contractual agreement from the traditional paper. The engineers went in and they developed this as a set of smart contract code. Uh, but the parties weren't happy with the outcome of the smart contract code. There was a dispute. And the judge actually ruled in favor of the smart contract code because it's not subject to interpretation. It's not subject to language interpretation. So when the code executes on a computer, it's ultimately truly false yes or no. So the most important step in developing these smart contracts is getting a good legal counsel and having a solid understanding of what you're developing in code and then a thorough review of that. And the biggest obstacle today is the efficient means of doing Yeah, so uh, since I've come from China, uh, since I've been more specifically, specifically in China, uh, what we are facing the obstacles. So the first obstacle is that the government don't have specific regula uh, regulatory uh, regulatory in this area at all. So um, when you whenever we do smart contract in the new business, we are not quite sure about whether the government will be okay with that. So sometimes it's uh, uh, like the Chinese government we already said no to ICO at all. So it's uh, among the few countries of our world. And also, uh, in the coin world or in the blockchain world in China, people lack of consensus at all. So in the north of China, uh, most companies and the, the governments they promote blockchain without coin. So it's like, kind of like the blockchain technology itself matters. 
and in the south of China, most people con uh, uh, concentrate on token economics, which is mostly focused on the utility coin and how it should be shared economics. So I think all these are uh, obstacles that we are facing to, uh, to form a more uh, better uh, unified uh, economy of the uh, smart contract. So uh, regarding that, then you making your own efforts working with government and all the laws in China to uh, do our best to make the consensus and to uh, help the regulatory, help the government to understand more about blockchain and why with all with all with all the coin the blockchain technology that we create technology. So in some other words there are questions as to how regulatory bodies will treat smart contracts in execution and perhaps questions as to how these contracts to your point Daniel might be construed in the program. Seem to be, to be uh, fairly significant. Yeah, right. I can add uh, a few things. Two years before, it was very difficult to use uh, blockchain because of the value of technology, and many cases I cannot uh, implement. But just now, after two years, we have more tools uh, to easily develop the any idea, uh, to uh, develop smart contracts. Uh, just now it's much better to say, and I can see we have a lot of tools. But uh, what I see the restriction in this uh, smart contract is a technology. We still wait to, uh, uh, for new frameworks. We wait for the frameworks much, must be more complex. And we need this is only restriction, the technology. And we will have enough functionality of technology we can implement uh, in smart contracts. So, and in our company we have many, many of these cases the customers come to us with many ideas. We have many ideas and we, but we are starting from the smart contracts, which is very stable and which work. work. I understand after years and years uh, work on this change uh, after box uh, standalone programs. So I understand that smart contracts is a standalone program and it, when you run it must work very stable. So, uh, going back to your point, Daniel, you mentioned that smart contracts are by necessity code. Um, and yet, I am wondering, do you see the eventual uh, refinement of uh, tools that will sort of bridge the gap between traditional contract language and code? In other words, um, are, or is the future going to be that there are those attorneys who understand code who can thereby read and uh, interpret smart contracts for the clients? And are there, are there any attorneys who are sort of bucking the dust because they never have to uh, run through code one by one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the future is definitely promising for smart contracts. Um, the difference between really the age that we're in now and the age that's coming with smart contracts lies in the protocol layers. So today we engage digital services primarily through HTTP protocol, the web protocol, and this protocol is very thin. Okay, so there's not a lot of parameters involved at the protocol layer, and lots of things are subject to interpretation and implementation at the application layer. Uh, Web 3.0 is completely different. It flips that pyramid and it creates a thick protocol layer so that developers can write more lean applications on this in-depth protocol and have a more cohesive and integratable system in the long run. So I think that now is the time that the legal minds need to be working with the technical minds in order to develop the best protocols. And once these protocols are solidified, I think the integration of smart contracts in society is going to happen very rapidly. It's going to happen much more rapidly than we saw with Web 2.0 uh, adoption and the explosion of the internet. Gotcha. Can we get a little, a little nerdy here and talk about the specific protocols that you see as being the most promising right now, um, whether it's protocol or the smart contract development framework, 
I think the go-to language here is solidity, right? Is that going to maintain its sort of dominance in the smart contract space, or are we going to see the growth? I mean, of other like with solidity, we see, uh, you know, that's that's the major language involved in programming the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, with Descent, we've taken a step back and we've created a set of APIs which really are integratable in any programming language. They work off WebSocket, you know, any developer can take this and do a Python development or a JavaScript development and utilize the blockchain. So I don't think it's so much at the language level that we're going to see the barrier. I think that the most widely adopted smart contract platforms in the future are going to be the ones that are the most scalable and have the best consensus models behind them. Uh, consensus is key to efficiency and scale when you're talking blockchain. And if you're doing a proof of work consensus like you're doing with Ethereum, you just simply can't scale to it. Okay? There's far too much consumer demand to use the platform than there is computing resources to process the transactions. So with Decent, we're a democratic protocol. We're uh, DPoS, delegated proof of stake, which means that token holders within our ecosystem have the ability to vote for community things that they consider important. They have the ability to vote for who mines and validates the transactions. And it's very similar to a corporate equity model whereby shareholders vote for their board of directors. Okay, so if you're a DCT token holder, you are able to vote with that DCT token on any of the things that the community does. And it's important that the smart contract platform that you choose for your development has uh, the ability to scale in the future. We saw so many ICOs last year on ERC-20 Ethereum platform. I feel badly for those investors because it, it's at least two years on Ethereum's roadmap before they're going to solve these problems, and there are going to be a lot of blockchains that pass them in the meantime, like EOS, like Decent, like Now. Uh, so, you know, the consensus at the heart of the ecosystem is, is most important to, to scaling and, and that's an option. Yeah, I, I, I won't speak to the protocol, but I will speak to um, the impact on, on lawyers. I think I see two things that are going to happen. Uh, one is, um, uh, it is much more common in my experience for a DLT company uh, to integrate a legal function at a relatively uh, early uh, age than it would be for a community DLT company. So, very unusual to have this like a new house the outside of the space. I wouldn't necessarily consider that unusual in the space. So there's certainly a number of examples of technology companies um, as a uh, practitioner in a firm, uh, I think uh, the challenge for us is to develop a good model for innovating uh, uh, technology. And uh, there are two that I'm aware of that are under way there. Um, one is uh, the reliance upon the Second is really a, a, a model that's adapted from the uh, IP world. Uh, it's another specialized world where you have uh, a subject matter expert, a technologist, uh, who would tell the story of the uh, law firms uh, and work in the court. Any other thoughts about the current state of, uh, of development? So let's say I'm just a practicing attorney. I hear about the smart contract stuff. Uh, I want to devise a smart contract for my clients. What's the what's the fastest way for me to get into this space? Okay, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if uh, your question, if I understand you, uh, you're trying to asking about development? Yeah, let's say I just want to automate a process for a client. I'm consistently entering into NDAs, and I want to make it a two-click process. How do I build that? Yes. Just, you know, yes. in five seconds. Exactly, ago. exactly. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, we use this um, um, concept uh, in an approach and every client wants to see uh, how this idea will work. 
So, and we'll start my fun a little bit. I was also going to push the uh, smart contract piece into the AI and IoT in this case because it has a little bit of a lot of things. I mean, maybe 2030 is going to be 2020, but we agree with you on all of that. But moving that aside, yes, I think lawyers will be around, partially because I think there's a false equivalence of smart contracts and legal contracts, just because they will have a contract in the plane or separate things, and it will still be more lawyers given the legal contract side of things. That said, I do think that what we now call smart contracts, and it was quite in the 12 years, but what we now call smart contracts would be just ridiculous. It makes too much sense to drive transactions autonomously and synchronously. Just why would we not do that? Right? Because technology is easier and easier. So. That makes sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to open up the audience now. So if anybody has a quick question, uh, the gentleman there in the middle, I see a hand up. Is it create smart contracts for the clients? So, a quick answer to that. First of all, I think technologically, absolutely, why not have it? And we already have some analysis. It would be hard for AI to read through a contract and say it's kind of this over. That said, there's ambiguity and such, so we're not going to necessarily trust it. It turns us to, I think about just driverless vehicles right now. Already safer in many ways than human driven vehicles, we don't like, trust them because we're in a box. and what's going to happen to the program it's happened so we're going to have thousands of fatal car accidents a year driven by humans we say well it's just the way the world works we get distracted by texting or sleep or drunk or whatever else but you have one or two with computers who say oh no we can't let this, uh, this, this technology go live so I think the ability to do that will arrive before people's comfort with that I've forgotten what the third thing say well, so I'll leave it right here I'll offer one a little space as well uh, for anyone who's interested in uh, the mechanics of building a smart contract I would I encourage you to look at a group called the Agreements Network, which has developed a code-free, uh, free and open uh, source um, solution for the development of smart contracts. Um, and I haven't toyed around with it yet, but my understanding is it's quite powerful. Again, it's the Agreements Network. Any other thoughts as to whether attorneys and how attorneys can start to use some of these tools? Directly. I, just, I agree with my colleague that uh, it's easier in the future. Yeah. The reason for that, I touched on earlier, is because the protocol layer is so deep. So, uh, you know, when we saw Web 2.0 came about, come about, the HTTP pro protocol had very few points to it, and developers were kind of given an open slate as to how to integrate this protocol. Web 3.0 is much different. The protocol layer is very rigid, and the application layer lacks flexibility due to the rigidity of the protocol layer. So, with strong protocols, it's actually harder to screw up in the application. So I believe that it will be quite easy for developers to build tools for lawyers and legal counsel to generate these smart contracts on their own. Makes sense. I think we have time for literally one more question. And in the front row, yes, please. Um, do you anticipate there's going to be a reflection in the last year? I guess I'm going to repeat that uh, for the whole uh, group here. Will, there, will, will the adoption of smart contracts lead to a reduction of litigation? I think so. Uh, you know, code, just from a fundamental standpoint, is much easier to interpret than contractual language. So I think the need to litigate smart contracts in the future, you're going to see a reduction compared to traditional contracts. And uh, you know the case that I cited earlier about the case in Hong Kong it was very interesting because that set precedent throughout the British Commonwealth. So now a smart contract is more valid than its paper equivalent in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Britain. We're talking major economic powerhouses in the world. I'm not sure of the, the state of smart contract litigation in the United States, but if we're not there already, I don't see it being too far down the road. 
Will thoughts on uh, the relative increase of the of litigation of like Yeah, I, I actually have a considerably more negative uh, uh, point of view. And uh, it's based upon uh, my experience with the last three years of knowledge. I began practicing the practice of the and the rules and the rules the and the rules and the rules and the impact that that's had in the United States is to spawn a whole new uh, 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 scope of uh, lit litigation and litigation practices around e-discovery. It's a concept that didn't even exist 20 years ago. Uh, we're contemplating creating tremendously more uh, data with, with uh, this technology, and I don't have any reason to believe that it's going to have a, a different consequence, at least in the U.S. Uh, than the last round of technology uh, had. It may reduce the number of transactional uh, lawyers that are required. As uh, conceptually, you, you might need a lawyer only to design a contract initially, and you can rely upon uh, non lawyers after that. But I'm curious that it's going to uh, reduce the, uh, the amount of litigation overall because of the increase in data. And on that cautionary note, I think we'll close out uh, this panel. Thank you very much to the panelists for participating. And thanks for